Uh, right. Uh, so thanks so much um, for attending uh, this talk today, and um, thank you to the um, No Time to Wait Steering Committee for inviting me to contribute this presentation to No Time to Wait 7. Um, my name is Kaylin. I work for the digital preservation team at Cambridge University Libraries, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, a Minecraft world that we acquired as part of our COVID-19 collection and what we're doing to try to preserve it. Um, I had a really downer title <laughs> um, for this talk because um, I was a bit, I guess, frustrated at trying to figure out how best to go about this. Um, but it's really turned around in the last couple of weeks, I'm happy to say. So, um, yeah, I'll talk to you more about how we've managed to do that. Um, right, so just a few um, points about Cambridge University Libraries, just to set the scene here. Um, Cambridge University Library, um, the University Library or the UL are all the same things. They're the main research library for the University of Cambridge. And then uh, Cambridge University Libraries are an additional 36 uh, faculty and departmental libraries associated um, with the main research library. So both Lane T and I work for the UL, but we're building services for digital preservation that will benefit all those libraries. Um, we're based within a directorate called Digital Initiatives and Strategy, and we work with colleagues uh, in collecting areas, um, like our university archivists um, and archivists who are building other kinds of um, collections, technology archives, for example, um, as well as our colleagues in the Digital Content Unit, uh, who Leontine mentioned as well, who uh, digitize physical items from our collections. Uh, we have a range of communities to serve, so not just thinking about the students within the university, um, but also uh, researchers as well, um, visiting scholars, the public as well. Um, so it also comes into play when thinking about um, how we preserve and make accessible our collections, whether or not they're physical or digital. Recently, a new strategy was published for the library, and I just wanted to point that out here because it's great to see digital represented in the strategy, um, as well as um, the range of materials that we have uh, within our collections and how we need to um, preserve both digital, physical, print materials, both um, new and those acquired over time. Um, so we really endeavor to use open source solutions for digital preservation and for um, supporting our digital collections in other ways. We have one of the biggest instances of archive space. Um, we are using Fedora for our repository uh, and building our own microservices as well to kind of um, uh, enhance um, what Fedora already provides. We use DSpace for our institutional repository, so these are e-journals, research data, um, as well as e-theses created by students and academics within uh, the university. And we also have a IIIF compliant um, Cambridge University digital library, um, affectionately known as Cuddle, um, <laughs> which is a great name for it, um, which has also recently been open source and is being used by uh, the University of Manchester as well. Right, so let's get more into the content of today's talk. Um, so like a lot of um, collecting institutions during the pandemic, Cambridge University Library also decided to collect materials created by its communities uh, in response to this time. Um, so this was led by myself, as well as Jackie Cox, who's the keeper of the university archives. So she's responsible for caring for materials um, created by areas of the university in both print and digital formats. Um, so these would be the official records of the university. So we um, decide to collect materials or put out a call to our um, communities to collect materials created in print or digital formats. We didn't put any sort of criteria around the kind of format or the type of material or, or the content. Um, we really just said it was uh, it needs to be created in response to the pandemic in some way and have a link to either the city of Cambridge or the university. In terms of digital, we received a lot of photos, videos, pamphlets, uh, a hymn that was written for Holy Week, um, websites or web content, um, artworks. Uh, Minecraft Cambridge is by far the most complex work that we acquired during this time and for this collection. And I'd say too that is the most complex work that um, 
exists across all of our digital collections. We were approached to collect a Minecraft chat um, by someone. So this was this person um, speaking to their friends about the pandemic and how they were spending their time. Um, but we said no to that, just uh, not knowing how to preserve WhatsApp and also the um, kind of data privacy concerns with acquiring that kind of, um, that kind of content. So in terms of how we went about this, um, it was really simple and set up um, quite quickly using um, Google Drives, um, Google Sheets to collect uh, metadata. Um, we put some information on the university library website and publicized it that way, um, and as well as contributing uh, websites to the UK web archive. So we're also a legal deposit library in the UK and um, are able to use this web archive or are, are legally um, I guess responsible for using and um, maintaining this web archive. Um, so just as a bit of a side note here, this led us to creating our deposit service. So we've greatly increased in the last um, couple of years our ability to collect and build born digital archives. So in Leontine's presentation, you heard about the materials that have already come into collections uh, on a range of handheld storage carriers. This is for new stuff that can be transferred securely over the web and links to our collecting policies and uh, information about data protection. Uh, we do um, plan to release this open source on our GitHub repository so it can be branded to another institution's um, uh, logo and, and whatnot styling. Um, so hopefully we can do that soon because it's been a great way to securely build those types of collections. All right, so um, let's get on to Minecraft Cambridge. So I just wanna um, start off this slide by saying I'm in no means um, an expert in Minecraft. Everything I've learned about Minecraft has been um, prompted by acquiring this work and um, trying to figure out how we would preserve it and hopefully also provide access to it. Um, so it was developed um, by Mojang Studios, it's a Swedish video game company um, and was purchased or the IP was purchased later by um, Microsoft. So that um, introduces some challenges for us in terms of the proprietary nature of the software. Um, there's lots of different modes that Minecraft can be played in, um, available for um, a range of operating systems and consoles, different kinds of versions for virtual reality education in different um, markets. Um, and it's one of the most um, widely played video games in the entire world still, so still incredibly popular. Um, so my research into um, Minecraft has also led me to find out other ways that Minecraft is being used in a more cultural heritage and higher education context. Um, so the, um, the image on the right is by um, uh, crafting the past of Minecraft Kilda, um, or St. Kilda, sorry, trying to recreate that uh, geographic area using Minecraft. And then the example on the right here is um, a version of Minecraft that Cambridge University Press and Assessment has created to help teach, um, teach English um, to students. Uh, right, so Minecraft Cambridge, um, like a lot of video games, has a great origin story. Um, it started as what's called a Camfession, which is a Facebook community on uh, uh, a Facebook community for the University of Cambridge, where students can anonymously submit um, Camfessions um, about things that are happening within the university. Um, so one was submitted by um, someone within a university asking for a Minecraft server, um, which was then read by a student within the cam uh, computer science department um, who was able to set one up. And when it was set up to when it was um, decommissioned, it was used by over a thousand members of the university community. So these aren't only students, but also um, alumni and, and staff as well. So we created, or we um, acquired the um, the Minecraft um, overworld as it was on September 21st. And it was really interesting, the discussions that we had about um, 
when would be the cutoff point to acquire that work. So we decided to collect it right before the new, new term started, um, but we could have waited or we could have collected it before, but that seemed to be a, na a natural break off point. Um, we also um, received metadata about its creation and compatibility with the Minecraft software, uh, emails with the depositor, um, which are really helpful when it came to accessioning um, this item into archive space. Uh, and in doing so, it became the first video game within uh, the University Library's collections. So if technology is on my side here, I can uh, show you a short video of, of Minecraft Cambridge. So even in the virtual, we can't escape the rain in, Cam in Cambridge or in the UK. <laughs> So um, if anyone's familiar with uh, the university, you might see some landmarks um, that actually exist in, in real life, but there's also some things within Minecraft Cambridge that aren't real. Um, there's a casino, for example, which to my knowledge um, doesn't exist anywhere within the university. Um, I don't know if we passed it yet, but there's like this giant bathtub rubber duck. Um, yeah, there we are around the corner here. Um, so, even though this work is incredibly complex and, and really different to the other kinds of digital materials we need to preserve, it was a great record and example of how um, student staff, alumni were coming together and spending their time during the pandemic, um, during times of lockdown and social distancing and coming together virtually to, to build this world. Okay. Um, and I also just want to say thanks as well to John Gossick, who's our technical lead for digital preservation, who was um, instrumental in getting this up and running. So in terms of what we actually acquired, um, it was this. So this looks quite different than the video that I just showed you. Um, so these are, uh, this is the world file on the left-hand side, um, which itself has folders and different files and formats within it. Um, I mentioned moments ago that over a thousand um, individuals had played Minecraft Cambridge while it was still running. So um, in the player data folder, there's an individual file for each of the players um, that have played this particular Minecraft world. Um, what's also interesting is the amount of online content that um, was published because of Minecraft Cambridge. Um, we have the Facebook content. I mentioned that confession community moments ago, um, kind of press release type of content published by um, the colleges saying that their um, buildings have been recreated virtually in Minecraft. Um, other social media content on Twitter. Um, this is from a student newspaper here. Um, and these really work together to provide a richer context when it comes to researching this work. So we'd if, even if you're not interested in Minecraft, you might be interested in um, how people were spending their time during the pandemic and more of the kind of social interaction rather than Minecraft itself and um, thought it was important to preserve um, online content as well relating to this uh, work. Um, right, so there's a lot of information on the slide. Um, it was really just to start thinking about um, the preservation planning for Minecraft Cambridge. Um, preservation planning is one of the functional areas within the OAS model, which I won't get into, but if you're working in digital preservation, you've um, probably heard that many, many times um, throughout your career. Um, so it's I personally think this is an, uh, an area of digital preservation that needs to be um, developed further. It's kind of a mixture of policy and concrete actions that work together to make up what's called a preservation plan. Um, but from what I've seen, there's no kind of agreed approach to preservation planning, um, and something a plan should be kind of um, informed by uh, whatever institution is, is needing to preserve um, the digital content. 
um, I put a few resources down here on the slide and um, just trying to combine um, a minimum viable preservation approach. Um, so this is kind of taking from software development and the idea of having a minimum viable product. So building something, getting it out there as soon as possible, learning from that and, and iterating and uh, improving upon it. So how can we um, apply that concept to digital preservation through minimal viable preservation and whether or not we could even extend that further in thinking about um, preservation planning as well. So it could be the case, for example, as I'll show you in a sec, um, we can preserve the bits of um, Minecraft Cambridge, but not necessarily or um, a limited amount of content level preservation happening. Um, but th I think this is the best way forward for us in, in terms of learning whether or not we're on the right track and then we can um, improve based on feedback that we get from our communities that want to use this work. Um, so there's a lot of different things involved in thinking about preserving um, a Minecraft world. So you have the files themselves, we have the email correspondent with the depositors that we also want to preserve um, so that we have that provenance information. Um, we have the web content. Um, I mentioned um, how Minecraft um, has been purchased by Microsoft, so we need uh, the Microsoft launcher or client in order to uh, render the game, uh, the server, and also a license. Um, we've also used some open source software, which I'll get onto in a moment. And then at the university libraries, we have um, our Fedora repository, as well as our uh, institutional repository. So that's built on DSpace that we'll, we plan on using, um, our archive management system, archive space, and also um, guidance on how to install and run Minecraft Cambridge that would need to be written as well. Um, this is just a quick um, overview or workflow diagram of how to install um, and set up a Minecraft server. Um, so um, having to you know, use terminal on your computer and um, put in the appropriate commands in order to run the server, but also having to go into the world folder um, that is created and replace it with the Minecraft Cambridge file so it runs that specific um, Minecraft world. Um, so in terms of what we're planning to do, um, we need to create some, um, some guidance and instructions on how to install Minecraft Cambridge. Um, using the Java edition of Minecraft, so that appears to be the only type of Minecraft that we can use for this purpose. Um, we have this idea of uh, a hard basket um, metadata flag that we want to include with um, any submission into our repository that's really difficult to preserve. Okay. And it will likely be called something else, but it's really to allow us really quickly to see the really challenging things that we have within our repository um, and to take further action at a future point if need be. Um, we plan on ingesting them into our um, institutional repository DSpace to enable access um, that provides those benefits listed on the slide there. Um, this image has turned out really um, really small, but in the bottom right hand side, we did need to create an access copy where we took out that player data, um, those to player data files, um, so that we didn't have that included um, within the access version that's downloaded from the repository just to um, protect the anonymity of the people who were playing Minecraft Cambridge. Um, just a few concluding thoughts. I think I have a minute or so left. Um, this is a lot of effort for one item, so it's, we need to think about how we balance um, having to preserve millions of files with you know, something, uh, a single item that demands more of our attention because it is um, so complex. Um, I mentioned, yeah, the personally identifiable inf information, so having to create an access copy that doesn't include such information, um, but having to find whereabouts within the Minecraft world such information might exist. Um, the solution that we've come up is highly dependent on the Minecraft, or sorry, Microsoft software. That's um, um, So we will likely need to think about an, a different solution in the future, but for now, this is really the minimum and the best that we can do. Um, 
And I'm also really interested uh, just generally about new spaces that are needed for more noisy content within collections. So we have a lot of quiet spaces for um, consulting works at the libraries, but I don't know where you would play something um, that has sound effects and, and where you might want to get together with um, your peers and, and talk about um, this work or other such works. Um, <coughs> so how do we go about, pardon me, <coughs> creating spaces for that kind of uh, use case? Okay, so that's it for me, and yeah, thanks a lot for your attention today. Uh, we have time for maybe one question. Yes, hello, thank you very much for this amazing work. <laughs> uh, can you elaborate a little on the hard, what, what you call, the hat basket flag, and um, did you envision for those very special uh, collections to add a, a very easy access, like a, a video of what you have shown, just to have a, an artifact showing what, what kind of material we can look at? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, are you asking what kind of things <coughs> we would assign that flag to? Yeah. Um, Probably things for which we can't guarantee content level preservation as well as bit level preservation. So probably not video. I think we're pretty confident that we can provide access to those formats, but more software-based works, um, maybe some research um, data within our institutional repository as well. Um, yeah, no, the idea was that when you have this flag, then you, you generate another artifact that is easier to access. Like, oh. a, like a video that you have shown, shown us? Um, that might be one uh, approach that we can take. I think we don't yet have a good sense of how, um, how vast this Minecraft world is, so whether or not we could do a walkthrough video, but that kind of, that takes away, um, I guess, from how Minecraft is meant to be used in terms of a, a player going in and exploring by themselves, but it might be kind of, um, an additional kind of um, file that we can offer to researchers who don't want to set up their own Minecraft server and have a Minecraft license to do that, um, just to get a sense of um, the look, um, but not necessarily the feel of, of the game. Thank you. Um, okay, let's give an applause to Kaylin. Thank you.